guest today is one of the great spiritual masters of our time. Awarded, celebrated, awarded the Nobel Prize. One of India's great national inspiration. I'm delighted to welcome him. Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women as ideas, vision and philosophy help define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of India's most distinguished scientists. He has led from the front for more than 40 years of experience and involvement with India's space program. He is the chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization, Secretary of Department of Space and has won numerous awards and accolades in India and around the world. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Madhavan Nair. Uh, Dr. Nair, you're one of the great uh, success stories uh, of Indian science uh, because uh, your grooming, your training has been entirely in India. And you have, uh, since uh, 2003 really, uh, led uh, the space program in India uh, towards indigenization. How important and how valuable has been this complete Indian orientation for you? Well, it has been a real challenge to work in a field like uh, space research. And we have all kinds of restrictions from all over the world. Because of the possible use of uh, dual use technologies, uh, there was technology denials. So we were really forced to work on ourselves and perfect the technologies. As you know, building a rocket, building a satellite, and uh, sophisticated control systems and all associated with that uh, is really working on the cutting edge of technologies by any world standards. And uh, in India, we could assemble a team, motivate them and bring up them up to the international level. So today we are world class technologies. We are in par with any other developed nations as well as space technologies. I think the sort of the, the, the celebration uh, of, of who you are and what you do is also that you are a product of Indian scientific education and training. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, there is international exposure that comes, uh, you know, through the process of development uh, of, of, of space technologies. And at the time when there is so much discussion and debate uh, on the quality of education and the future of education, uh, I just wanted to celebrate and acknowledge the fact that you're a product of this process and I'm have really achieved so much. You know, I'm uh, totally homegrown and so that. And uh, one thing which, you know, in our time, there were good teachers. That made all the difference. You know, the colleges, what we had. And uh, there every, the professor, the teachers, etc., they were so passionate about imparting knowledge to us. So that helped. Then subsequently, you know, the type of uh, the enthusiasm and encouragement we got from people like uh, Professor Sarabhai, Dr. Kalam. And that is remarkable. You know, they were a, a people of a separate class. You know, they, they used to really uh, show the right path and put you on the right track and enable you to acquire knowledge. And uh, perhaps that is the ISRO culture, you know. In ISRO, everybody learns all through the career. And as time goes, they become the uh, super specialists and they, they can uh, contribute significantly to the world community. You know, there, is, there is great concern about uh, brain drain in so many uh, areas and so many specializations because you know, ultimately you are a government funded organization, your institution is working with government salaries uh, and you know, while you, ex you know, offer exciting, creative job environments. Uh, so what kind of challenges do you confront both in terms of new recruitment from Indian institutions and holding the key people that, that you work with? This is one of the serious problems we are facing today. Uh, if you know that uh, today the most of the high end of education institution, their products are either going abroad or joining the multinationals and other IT companies and so on. Whether you follow uh, fundamental science or uh, civil engineering, everybody lands up in IT industry. So the net result is uh, the government departments are forced to take uh, so-called leftovers. But we are not compromised on our quality. We conduct a series of uh, tests at all day level and finally we crystallize a few hundred people. But they are really green. And uh, one thing I have noticed, the people who join and work with us for a few years, they will stick with us simply because of the challenge associated with the space. 
and you know the, uh, the, the I don't think any other department or any other institution in the country offers a challenging jobs and uh, not the money which matters but you know the, the technology challenge keeps them alive. Of course, we are trying to overcome this through a different process. Uh, we have initiated what is called a catch them young, that is at plus two level itself. We are catching the bright youngsters, putting them through an exclusive course and we have set up an institute called Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology at Thiruvandavaram. It started functioning last year and almost a year over and we got the best of the students from the IIT entrance exams and uh, we hope in about three, four years they will join our mainstream and they will be the products for the future. You know, we, you know, uh, we record this, it's been less than a month uh, since the um, sort of much celebrated um, achievement of uh, you put your organization putting 10 satellites you know, uh, out simultaneously in, 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 in uh, launching them. What is the what is the significance of them? Uh, you know, this has been done eight satellites before. You've made it ten. Uh, what is the unique achievement of being able to put ten out ten out of them at the same time? See, as the number goes, the mission complexity increases. But all these satellites, you know, they have to be raised to a certain altitude, let's say 600, 700 kilometers, and then they are imparted with a velocity something like 7.4 kilometer per second. In that velocity, we have to control each one of them within fraction of a meter per second and then give a specified orientation. So the entire is just not alone leaving them in space, but you know after that they will start diverging. So we should make sure they don't get into a collision path at any time. So uh, doing a mission simulation for the entire uh, trajectory and all those things, you know, they are really challenges. And uh, this was a very unique opportunity. We had two primary satellites, Cartosat 2A and uh, Indian mini satellite. First time we are flying a mini satellite and then the international community and we really liked it you know the the student community in uh, canada and uh, germany they built uh, what is called nano satellite you know very tiny ones about 3.5 kilogram a smallest one and the largest one is only 7.5 kilogram and it is packed in a box almost like the container which you see you know and uh, once you go to space very precisely we had to nudge them into their orbit uh -huh. A uh, really exciting job. I think uh, our, our team has done a wonderful job in managing the mission and all the satellites have been put into their designated orbit. Their signals are strong and good and everybody is happy about the event. In a sense that you were taking the, the you know, the, the process of launching satellites as a, as a purely commercial enterprise into something more, working with young people, working with students, uh, in, in fact, uh, you know, creating a sense of, uh, for want of a better word, shall I say, perhaps community bringing together uh, people from different parts of the world in this process of experimentation and even willing uh, you know, for these students to, to lower the price uh, that, that, that you were charging. But this is really in a sense a percussa, I mean not launching of satellites but to this very eventful year ahead uh, for ISRO and that is the, you know, the launch of your you know, moon mission and you know a projection if, uh, in, uh, of, of, uh, um, in, in, in not too distant a future after that of a soft landing on the moon of a, of a, of a man of, 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 of a vehicle on the moon um, why are we going into this area of uh, the vicinity of the moon what what is the advantage well uh, <laughs> I, I think you know the moon has been explored in the early days in the mid 60s by the Russians and Americans but all those studies were concentrated at a specific location in the moon uh, wherever they could land or uh, they could uh, go around they have picked up some signals. But a comprehensive knowledge of the lunar surface, its mineral content, it is not yet available. So there is a lot of enthusiasm among other people uh, for primarily two reasons. One is uh, if we can find some interesting minerals like helium-3 or maybe even uh, the atomic fuel and things like that. Uh, then if they are available in an exploitable form, later one can go there and then try to bring back and so on. So this is a precursor to that. More than that, the fundamental knowledge, you know, the moon has spun off from the earth uh, and, uh, when it was getting a wall and uh, there is no atmosphere around moon. So the virgin form, it is existing there. So we get a lot of ideas as to the origin of the earth and so on. And this gives a very good opportunity for the scientific community to understand the universe in a better way. And again, as you know, the, the scientific community in the country, they are shrinking. 
this provides a good platform for them to sharpen. Uh, for example, for the moon mission, uh, we could assemble something like 22 working scientific groups within the country other than ISRO to collect the data, analyze and use it. So that provides a good scientific base for the future planetary exploration and so on. The twofold, one is understanding the moon at close quarters uh, and we are going to have this orbiting for about two years and in two years it will collect the data on the height, elevation and of course with the samples uh, which can be got and so on. And at the end of that we have a full map of the moon. And the next mission as you rightly said we are going to land there pick up some samples and analyze whether what we have seen by remote sensing is correct or not. So this is going to be a, a continuing series by which uh, first it is going to enhance the knowledge, second if it is a commercial potential is there at the appropriate time we will be able to exploit. Mm -hmm. We're back right in a moment, you're watching a conversation with uh, the chairperson of the Indian Space Research Organization Dr. Madhavan Nair, don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with the chairperson of uh, uh, ISRO and Secretary Department of Space. You know, I, I think the, the, the sort of the implicit question that always arises is, you know, a developing country, we're spending so much money on space technology, uh, in space research. Um, you know, as far as uh, satellites go, the, uh, you know, the, the remarkable work you have done on PCLV uh, that, that you worked on developing has a, a, an obvious utilitarian aspect you know, from telemedicine to education in schools to remote sensing and a whole range of areas and we'll come to that in a moment. But what is the, what is the utilitarian aspect uh, for uh, a mission to the moon? And, and it is true, we must recognize that, you know, m you know, many countries have done this as a matter of prestige. They'll have the Chinese sending up a man, you know, into space uh, because it boosts national pride, national confidence and, and the intangibles in a sense. Uh, so, uh, and, and this does involve the allocation of vital resources ostensibly from development and other priorities. Have you done, uh, is, is there some kind of uh, cost benefit analysis and is there some kind of analysis of relative costs, I mean in, in terms of what ISRO is spending on putting a satellite or you know around the moon uh, and, and what another country might be spending in developing that. So that's two questions into one. Well I think uh, <laughs> I, I quite often face this question <laughs> and in the beginning of the space program you know exactly this question was asked to Dr. Sarabai. Uh -huh. He said we are going to acquire self-reliance in technology and also going to apply them for the benefit of the society. Today we have achieved it. Uh, you take telemedicine, tele-education, resource management, water resource management, agriculture, then fisheries, every field we have contributed. Uh, I would like to quote from a study conducted by Matra School of Economics. Close to two billion dollars is what we have spent on space program until the year 2003. And the direct benefit in terms of the television channels, the communication we are providing, the images we are getting and so on, that itself adds up to more than 3.5 billion dollars. So that means more than the money spent on the space program has been returned to the country. So uh, the relevance of space program and how it benefits the country is well established. Now uh, let's look at this way, uh, at that time we dreamt that we should have satellites, we should have uh, launch vehicles and so on and that over 20 years we have rectified. Similarly, today we are looking at space as the next frontier for humankind. Uh, planet Earth is only one, God forbid something happens somewhere, we do not have an alternative. So naturally man will be looking at the space and the nearby objects like moon or Mars where we can migrate or uh, settle down colonies and so on. But that may be a vision for 30 to 50 years from now. But how do we achieve that? We have to have a step by step process. We have to have the capability to access space that we have today. Next, can we take a human being to space? We are thinking of formulating some projects and so on. And then the next step will be can we take this to moon where we can colonize and so on. So it is a, it's a logical sequence which is leading to that. Now about the budgetary aspects. Uh, last plan budget uh, we have spent uh, close to about 12,000 crores. Out of that hardly 300 crores is what we are spending for the moon mission. The remaining is hardcore delivery to the country for the national development program. So we are investing a small fraction of our whole space program budget for the futuristic things and that we are definite we will get back in no time. 
So that is the confidence with which we are undertaking this. See, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the scientific temperament in the country has to be brought back. There was a time there were dreamers, you know, in the, uh, any branch of science in the country and they were leaders. But today we are not getting anybody to follow science. So we give an exciting platform like AstroSat, you know, there is an orbiting laboratory which goes around, looks at the galaxies and stars and so on and gets a signal from there. And then, you know, the imagination of the whole scientific community grows up. Similarly, the moon, we, we know it is a beautiful object from here, but we go close to it, we do not know what is in store for us. So, you know, that is the kind of thing which we are investing on. Mm -hmm. In terms of your sort of uh, uh, personal excitement from the, from the engaging in, this, in, the, in, in, in the space program and, and being at its helm now, there is of course the technology aspect that, that you have and, and I should really sort of you know, remind our viewers that you were the, the lead director and, and the person who led the team developing the PSLV, uh, you know, the Polar Satellite Launching Vehicle, which is now the workhorse of the space program. So you're a hands-on scientist. But what about the more, uh, you know, I guess for, for lay people, there is the whole romance of, of space and, and the mystery and, and fueled somewhat, I suppose, by uh, uh, science fiction and Star Trek and, and, and what have you. So in your own, you know, work, um, has, ha has at any time, you know, the element of the mysterious, uh, mysterious come in, sort of the unusual, the remarkable, I don't know. Do you believe in flying saucers? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you see, you know, uh, the quite often, you know, finding a solution to a technology problem, it does not come by equations and uh, the, the computer outputs and so on. A uh, uh, certain amount of intuition and, you know, to a feeling of things, you know, that, that comes in. So naturally, yes, uh, that, that uh, I, I will not claim that I am a very strong, but still, you know, a, a sort of a sixth sense which drives you. Uh, and perhaps, you know, we find very complex equations, we make a lot of simulations and they know that nothing will be uh, seen and we have so many paths to be taken. But uh, something strikes your mind, okay, you do this, uh, it'll, it takes you to the right path. Uh, then again, you know, the moon always is, is uh, always used to excite you, you know, uh, it creates a romantic feeling in you and uh, the, the, the fact that we can go near to it and have a closer look at it is really uh, thrilling. You're watching a conversation with the chairperson of the Indian Space Research Organization, uh, the remarkable scientist, uh, uh, Dr. Madhavan Nair. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. <music> Welcome back to a continuing conversation uh, with the uh, preeminent Indian space uh, scientist, uh, Dr. Madhavan Nair. Um, tell me that in terms of uh, the, the applications of uh, space technology uh, from the missions uh, and, and, and the projects that you're initiating. What are the kind of changes as consumers, everyday consumers of good services and technologies uh, can we expect in the coming years that will be a spin-off of the work that you're doing? Today you see the DTH. We have virtually revolutionized how the entertainment happens in the country. I think we are really proud of it. I think hundreds of channels simultaneously available on rooftop. Again, the telemedicine, it's a real success story. You know, the people, the specialists who are sitting in Delhi, Calcutta, or Bangalore, they are able to provide services to 3,000, 4,000 kilometers away. And, you know, the poor villagers, they are able to get a high quality medical service on their doorstep. Drinking water, I think half the country where the drinking water problems are there, we have already implemented a scheme. Uh, about uh, 250,000 wells have been dug in the last uh, three, four years. Which is basically a remote, remote sensing, sensing technology is making, pointing to where you uh, may sh absolutely. should do this. Mm -hmm. And you know, the direct saving out of that itself will pay m for the satellites. So that's the kind of benefit which has come. The fishermen, they're enjoying the bigger catches and the shorter distance for travel and so on. Then uh, recently what we have introduced like a village resource center. It's a single window uh, uh, system by which people get advantage of remote sensing services for the local development, then the telemedicine and tele teleeducation. In fact, recently one cluster of uh, village resource center, we have implemented a scheme by which the village, uh, the school dropouts and even the SLC pass, those students were imparted with skills uh, like uh, plumbing or electrical and so on. And thousands of students were trained within a year and they were enabled to take up employment. Most of them got self-employed, earning few thousand rupees a month. 
This is a big success story. This is all done from a central place using the remote village resource centers. This is a product of uh, you know, communications and uh, satellite imaging. What are some of the, the sort of more futuristic things in, 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 the, in the next decade, five years, ten years, twenty years, that we might be able to begin doing that we're not doing currently? Uh, well, first of all, we will try to get the low cost access to space. You know, even today people talk about uh, space tourism. At the uh, current cost, twenty million dollars for a passage, nobody would like to go there. But if you can bring down the access to space, that's going to be one of the aspects. So you see, like uh, recoverable and uh, reusable launch vehicles. In fact, that has been another another one of your relatively recent successes that you've been able to put uh, satellite, satellite and in space and bring it back and so safely. Yes. You know, with enormous implications for the perhaps taking you know a man out uh, into space. Uh, how how real a possibility is that? When do you think that might happen? We have made a total study. Today, we assess the technology, capability exists. We can do this job and uh, maybe by 2015, we will be able to have our manned orbit. Then, you know, we are in the satellite imaging itself, we will be going for microwave imaging. See, today, you know, visible band, so whenever clouds are there, we cannot see below that. If there is a microwave system, we can see through the clouds and day and night imaging is possible. Then in the communication itself, large bandwidth connectivity between point to point through satellite, that is going to catch up for the future. So we are uh, newer systems, we are developing for that. So uh, there is a certain amount of new technologies which is being developed for uh, communication satellite, the earth observation system. Uh, for example, you know, today we are seeing four bands uh, when we look at the ground. But if you've got a continuous visibility like our eyes, you know, we can discern things in a much better way. Uh, Hyperspectral imager, we are trying to develop for that purpose. Uh, again, the host of applications which can be used for uh, mineral detection or oil detection. And of course, uh, the environmental monitoring, that becomes a very important aspect. We would have a host of satellites which will be continuously looking at it. Then disaster management, we would like to look at the spots which is affected. See, for example, recently Myanmar uh, things have happened and China. Our satellite images were made available to those countries free of charge. So that, you know, a social cost is being built up in such cases. Of course, there is a challenging task with respect to earthquake. We, we have no way of detecting it. So whether we can have technologies of that kind. So these are the type of dreams which we have for the future. Ultimately, by 2015, we would like to have the man presence in the orbit. And by 2020, we should have a recoverable and reusable launch vehicle system. And uh, then man on the moon. It's a <laughs> long way to go, but uh, yes, I think after the orbit, uh, it will take at least five years before we, you require uh, huge boosters. You see, going to orbit and coming back, you require about 11 kilometer per second as a velocity addition, but going to moon, it is almost doubling the requirement. So, large rockets are required. We are investing on what is called a semi cryogenic rocket system for the future for this purpose. You know, as 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 uh, a scientist who dreams dreams, uh, you know, beyond what you see currently, are you able to predict with existing technologies and ex existing possibilities? If you were to sort of look ahead into the future, I don't know what, 50 years from now, uh, you know, in the sense that it was Orson Welles and it was other sort of, uh, you know, writers and intellectuals who foresaw space travel, our, you know, traditional literature, uh, you know, foresaw aspects of, uh, uh, you know, space travel research and, and the unfolding of science, which at that time, well, may well have been happening, but, you know, let us assume that it was a projection of the human spirit. So when you do that, what are the kind of remarkable things uh, that you see might happen, you know, beyond your lifetime and my lifetime and perhaps even those watching this program uh, out there in space? Well, I, I, I think uh, the space colonization, see, uh, when Columbus left uh, Europe and went to America, that was a, a new chapter. Similarly, when Indians go to the orbit and beyond, that's another chapter. And uh, that type of colonies, you know, whether it's a small cluster or maybe on the moon or Mars, that could be the thing of future. And uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know, people are thinking that, you know, there are life in a planet which is 4.5 uh, light years away, 4.5 million light years away. So uh, that distance can we travel. If you want to travel, we have to hibernate and then get revived and so on. I don't know, I, I think this is all wild dreams what we can have. <laughs> but I'm sure man is going to fly off. You know, very often uh, when, you know, the astronauts have been in space and they've looked at Earth 
uh, and you know Einstein has sort of also famously uh, you know talked about how when he looks at science and he looks at the order in the universe that he's reminded of some way of the divine uh, do you have a sense of the divine of God uh, in, in whatever form and shape something larger than the the mechanistic world of science Science cannot explain divinity. There, are, there is a subtle difference. But as a, but as, as a individual, <laughs> uh -huh. yes, I do believe there are certain things which are happening which is well beyond our control. Even when we had a flop in the uh, last launch, you know, is uh, really unbelievable. You know, in a such a complex system which goes through a series of meticulous tests, one small human error has caused the entire mission. Why should happen? Uh, then okay, you start believing there is something beyond. You know, there is a traditional image in 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 in, in popular imagination uh, of the Indian scientists who will go to a temple and pray uh, before the success of a scientific enterprise, uh, or um, I don't know what use astrology uh, to decide on an auspicious date or. You know, I, I think that in, in many parts of India, the notion of Rahu Kalam, an auspicious time of the day, is very important. <laughs> Do any of these factors come into play? In I, I believe every second in a day is as auspicious as other. Okay, that part is okay. But at the same time, as an individual, uh, I believe in the forces beyond us. I do go to places of worship. Is not limited to Hindu temples alone. I go to churches, mosques, other places also. That is to get a sort of a personal, you know, satisfaction and uh, that kind of thing. It's nothing to do with the, you know, what performs uh, in the scientific realm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You've had, as I said in the introduction to the program, uh, you know, I think I, I was trying to calculate the way in 42, 43 years. Uh, from the time you started off in in in, in Thumba, uh, with with that project uh, association with the Indian uh, you know, space project in different capacities and um, you know we have a tradition in 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 other parts of the world where in a sense the scientist never retires because there's a space and context in universities for ongoing research. However, in India we tend to have, in particularly in government employment, we tend to have a retirement age. Uh, you know, how do you reconcile, you know, the much longer creative potential that individual has in the time he has to retire and sit it out? Uh, well, I think we have set a slightly different pattern. Mm -hmm. In ISRO, at least the scientists who are productive, they are contributing. We extend the term well beyond the 60 years. And uh, the Prime Minister was, uh, uh, he has helped us in extending this all the way up to 65 years in selected cases. So, in fact, my case itself, I'm uh, going to be 65 soon. But, uh, you know, uh, the government encourages such things. But the factors are you have to be productive and contributing. And uh, I think quite a few scientists in the country, they don't retire. There are a large number of examples you can cite. Uh, you take Professor Yuvar Rao, who was our ex chairman. He is now very active, he is leading our science program. And uh, like that, you know, there are very good examples. So the mind never stops. Do you ever okay. think of, 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 of retirement? No, uh, how can I retire? I have to keep working <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Whether you hold on post or other things, different matter. But you know, your brain is always active, and there are so many people you can discuss things and you know work out some good solutions and so on. And when you step down from ISRO, and, and may that be a very long time from now, what would you want people to have said about you? And you know, this was Dr. Nair, and this is what he did. Uh, in fact, I have the telemedicine. Village also said uh, they are products of that. So here is one scientist who have taken the high tech to the grassroots level in the country. Dr. Nair, thank you very much. This has been a great honor and a great privilege, amazing, a great master. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.